Welcome to Transformers, a program specially designed to showcase the talents, knowledge and the life of HR professionals. Today we have with us Dimuthi Alvis, Director HR, Hema's group of companies. Welcome to the program Dimuthi. Thank you Nirosha. Of all the sessions that we are doing with HR professionals, we feel covering each topic to be able to understand the depth and from your experiences of what you've gone through is very, very important. So today, we've selected this important topic of recruitment and selection because we believe hiring the right person to find the right fit for the organization is very, very important. So to open the discussion, uh, talk to us about recruitment and selection from your way of thinking. Sure. Uh, so Nilushan, I would like to first of all say that uh, when you look at, before we looking at recruitment and selection, we need to first consider the entire HR function as a whole, yeah. uh, rather than taking each process in isolation. Okay. When you develop a HR strategy. Okay. So having said that, let me talk about HR uh, go into depth in terms of recruitment and selection. And uh, I will talk to you on five aspects that I like to draw from our marketing colleagues some of the concepts that they use to uh, market their products. Okay. And uh, before I get into that, I, uh, there are certain prerequisites that I assume are in place in the organization when I try to do these five steps. Okay. Uh, that would be, uh, uh, I would assume that the job analysis has been already done and the job description is already in place where you, you describe the job properly, competency profiling is done, you describe the person also in the job specification. So that is one prerequisite we need to have. Okay. I also assume the organization structure is in place in a proper way. Uh, job evaluation is done and you have positioned the person's, uh, person in the right place in the organization. At the same time, I assume uh, the manpower planning is also done and now we are set for recruitment. One thing is uh, if you are to attract the right person, you need to first develop something called employer value proposition, which is uh, in marketing you call USP or unique selling proposition, right. yes. which is uh, you try to visualize and paint a picture to the labor market. This is what you will get in terms of the total experience in a company. Okay. And in, uh, in exchange, we need you to perform these areas uh, in a particular job vacancy if, if at all you are going to advertise. So that is, that is basically building the employer brand in the labor market so that the attraction would be easy and you can attract people in a lesser time period. So the five uh, concepts or pillars that I'm trying to draw from marketing would be first understand, marketing would always first understand the customer. Similarly, I think uh, HR professionals and those who do hiring, the hiring managers, first need to know what this job role is all about and what are the things that we need in this particular job. Uh, at the same time, who is the right person? Before we even advertise or think of, before keeping the first step, we need to first understand who is this person we are looking for? What is he? What is, what is he? Where is he? Uh, what is his social background? Uh, what, what type of characteristics should he have? So all these things generally, uh, the input comes from the uh, job analysis program. Uh, but we need to understand that first of all, uh, the hiring manager at the same time, the light manager. The second step I would say, okay, now that we really profile the person, what is the best way to attract? Marketeers always use different sorts types of communication channels, attraction, promotion. So similarly, HR also needs to understand, if you really understand whom you are trying to attract, okay. then what is the best method to reach out, okay. communicate. So that's the second concept, I would say, uh, that we need to adopt from marketing. Uh, I'd like to uh, give a good example of that. Uh, something I, I, I think it's good if I read it out to you. Uh, this, is a, this is a two sentence advertisement which appeared in, in a paper centuries ago. Uh, let me read it out. Men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter coal, 
long months of complete darkness. Uh, at the same time, safe return doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. Now, this is an advertisement that appeared in papers in nine, uh, 1890 when the explorer Ernest Shackleston put a job advertisement for the first Antarctic expedition. Okay. Now, let's, little, I mean, let's dwell on that a little bit. He's a promising sun and the moon. He's spot on of what he really wants. He has profiled the candidate. Uh, in what I just read, basically, all you will expect, or all you can expect is honor and recognition. That is also in case of success. So there's no guarantee, guarantee. Of that, right? Yes. So small wages, bitter cold. So you are, you are basically painting the picture. So today's world, if you put advertisement like that, uh, I'm sure someone will ask, who will apply? I'm sure those days also the same question came to him, but only the brave, daring, and who will uh, go through any challenge in return of honor and recognition will only apply. And that's the type of people he wanted. That's right. So he has correctly profiled the person, and uh, I'm sure he got the right people he wanted. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm talking about. When we try to attract, we need to profile the person properly, use the correct methodology and the, and the channels of communication uh, to attract the people. Right. And uh, third would be, okay, now you've had the candidate. How do you know he's the best out of lot? At the same time, not only the best, does he fit the role that we really want? Right. So there's so many tools, techniques that people use in today's world. Interview is most, I would say, the, the famous or, or commonly used uh, technique. But there are so many yeah. uh, which today's companies adopt. Uh, it could be psychometric testing, te uh, on the job testing, so, so many things. That's right. So we need to, re but from job to job it differs. We can't have the one cap fits all methodology right. and interview, assume that interview will solve all the problems. Right. So we need to first understand what is the job and then design the technique accordingly. And then you need to monitor, implement and monitor as marketers always do. You can't just put the advertisement and expect everything to happen miraculously. So the child also has to monitor the progress, limiting the time to fill. Um, and finally, the fifth concept, I would say, compliance, which we generally don't take into consideration. When you, when you do a recruitment, we don't, uh, that naturally doesn't come to our mind. Uh, compliance could be of three ways. For example, uh, are you carrying out your recruitment process as per your company ethics and values. Are you sticking to that? Or is the time pressure to fill makes you forget some of the ethics? So that's one compliance. Second would be the legal compliance, obviously. But in Sri Lanka, I think our legal system is such that we don't have much uh, constraints like the West. For example, discrimination in policies or gender uh, imbalances. As an, uh, in Sri Lanka, we don't have much of that today, but I think I'm sure those things will come in, uh, in, in the time to come. And then third would be good management practices. Those three, if you can comply to those three. Uh, I, I read recently uh, in Canada, so it's a funny example that I'm going to quote. Uh, a company uh, received, uh, and the caption was, computer ate my resume. Uh, candidate applied to a job and for some technical error the employer received only part of the resume so they, at the shortlisting he did not get selected and when he gets, got to know that uh, he did not get the uh, job he made an appeal to the public service commission and they it went to the court and the judge upheld that it's the employer's responsibility to see, employer definitely saw the, uh, it's been cut off That's right. half, okay. so they did not give an equal opportunity to the candidate to present himself. So those type of laws today we don't have in That's Sri Lanka. Right. But other than that, there are so many other things we need to comply with. So those five pillars I'd like to take out from marketing for our chat today as an initial uh, 
thought. Excellent. I mean, um, I think in this day and age, where most of us sit around and ask our employees, what do you do? And then we write their job description. Not what they <coughs> ought to be doing, but they, what they are doing. Hmm. And these job descriptions through time have been within the organization. And sometimes in recruitment hmm. and selection, we use these uh, job descriptions to be able to hire the next. And you did say, all those prerequisites held constant. But I just wanted to know, not to go into depth about uh, the technicalities of JDs, but to understand, do we have those prerequisites in place right now? Good question. I think answer would be yes and no. So depends on uh, some companies, obviously, I am sure we have good practices. Uh, uh, I'm sure my, through my experience and my, the colleagues that I meet and the thoughts we exchange, That's right. I think the practices are in place, but not in all organizations. Right. So I think it's good that we sh I mean, have, have these type of discussions and, right. and educate, create awareness of good practices so that others also can follow. Very good. Because, Timut, um, I come across many companies and they, they, they have very good practices. But some of the most fundamental, rudimentary aspects of clarity in terms of job is absent. And when that is absent, like we said before, yeah. all the other HR processes, including you hire the wrong person for the wrong job, yeah. uh, because you've thought of a particular person when you actually wrote the JD and nothing else. That is why I thought of looking at these prerequisites. Um, many people see recruitment and selection through the eyes of interviews. Hmm. And they look at the interview skill process. <clears throat> How do you see interviews? So, uh, interview is something you get a short window to judge a person. Yeah. Right? I don't think uh, that's quite good enough. Okay. So, uh, organizations need to have multiple ways of assessing candidates. That's right. Interview will give you some input, okay. uh, but at the same time, uh, you need to have different cover. You need to cover different dimensions of a candidate, and also uh, in Sri Lanka and I'm sure in many other countries, we have a thing called probationary period, where you really test them out because that's the period you will actually get to know whether he can do the job or not. Because at the interview, I'm sure everybody will say they can do the job. Yeah. And uh, so it's up to the line manager basically to constantly have an eye on the person and see that he delivers and quickly, uh, if he's not doing it, then uh, elevate those issues quickly and have corrective measures. I'm not saying that within the first month to ask him to go is the, uh, is the right thing to do, but we need to have corrective actions. Otherwise, uh, you will be basically uh, inheriting something that you really didn't want to. Yes. Thought of uh, mentioning a few tools and getting your input from your experience. For example, assessment centers. How valid are they? So there are assessment centers that are certified, meaning gone through research, proven, uh, and time tested. So I think it's good to use some of those things. Okay. And also, uh, you need to know when to use assessment. Just like interview, right. uh, assessment centers can ser test certain things yes. and give you a result. Uh, but uh, that's also under uh, constraint. You are in a room, uh, or depends on the, uh, the design of the assessment center, and, and time is short. Candidate also know that people are watching you. So all those things are there. Yes. So it's not actually a real life scenario, even though you try to simulate as much as you can. That's right. Uh, because the outside world, is assumed constant, which is not in the real life. So I would say probation period is the real test sure. Uh, sure. Sure. for anybody to perform. Right. Uh, but I, do, I also don't think we should assume, okay, probation will take care of everything and, and not do the process right. I think we need both. That's right. Probation time uh, is very, very important. Because on the job, you truly get to know who this person is, how they fit into the rest of the culture, uh, and the work colleagues, and all of that. Uh, just to go through the tools, is psychometric uh, 
well, psychometric tests are used all over the place. Is it legal? Is it fair? Uh, if, if, for example, you are a more right brain person and not necessarily very mathematical, many would say you don't score very well. What are your thoughts on psychometric tests? Right. It depends on what I'm trying to find out yes. of the individual. And does it have a relationship to what you were looking for in the candidate? Okay. Say, there are people with right brain, people with left brain, people balanced people, skewed, yes. all sorts of people in the world. Brain is generally programmed and difficult to reprogram. I'm not saying impossible, okay. but it's, it takes time and it takes techniques. Okay. So you pretty much get a person uh, and try to ch expect to change. That may not happen uh, unless you, have, you really strive hard with a lot of things. So I think a psychometric test, I'm not sure whether it's legal or illegal. I, I really don't know. Mm, I haven't come across a situation where someone has claimed it's illegal. Right. So that's why we still practice it. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you ask me whether it's fair, it depends. Uh, I, I don't see it's unfair because you are trying to, try to assess a person right. uh, and see his suitability. That's but right. at the same time, uh, I don't think psychometric testing is something we should use as a selection tool because you need, uh, you, I, if you use it as a development tool uh, and try to really find out what this person is all about and, uh, and play, uh, develop your plan around those things, some of the things, I think it will be uh, better. Uh, and at the same time, I think a lot of people I have seen once you get the psychometric paper, you don't reveal it to them as candidate. You keep it filed in the personal file, yeah. and only the chair manager is privy to that information. And that is useless. <laughs> Absolutely. Because I ask these questions, Dimut, because in HR, very often we don't realize what these tools are meant for. Some of these psychometric tests were for development purposes, and some uh, on leadership training, a DISC, <coughs> Myers-Briggs, uh, yeah. Belbin, some to create uh, a more team environment to understand how they work. And without uh, knowing this, or in the absence of this, they use all sorts of tools mm. to determine people. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, recently I was listening to a particular person saying, if you understand eye accessing cues to understand whether eye goes on to the left side or the ro right side, you can actually understand how the person thinks and thereby, even at an interview, you ought to be able to understand, even if they say something, you ought to be able to understand what they're thinking. Hmm. Now, there are these fancy tools that, that come about. What are your thoughts on these things? So, uh, to be honest, I haven't come across, come across uh, something like that. Okay. I mean, if I go back to my original five pillars, if you can find, uh, if you use something, a technique like that, you need to know what you are using it for. Oh. If you can get something out of that, which is a good input to your se selection decision, I don't see anything wrong. But as you correctly said, we don't think like that. Yes. Many, many of us uh, get carried away with uh, uh, latest techniques, yes. and then you like to adapt. That's right. And then you like to tell, OK, see, our company has these things. That's, right. That's a danger. That's right. If you know really what you are going to use it for and the benefits, then I don't see anything wrong. If they are tested. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Tested and certified and professional yeah. at doing it. To move the conversation to a different angle. See, at the interview sometimes your expectation is such, but the type of people that come for the interview may be below that or may be above that. So what you try to do is choose the best mm. that have come for an interview, not necessarily the right fit. And many HR people would say this is so only because it is very hard to find the ideal candidate. What are your thoughts on this? That, uh, I totally agree with you. I think I, may, I myself may, be, may have done that same thing in the past. See, uh, you get a pool of candidates and you try to select the best. Okay. If that is your objective, 
you will definitely do that. And you, your tools will also be programmed to get the best. Uh, even uh, say, uh, for example, uh, in a management training program, you get about two, three thousand applicants, and the tendency is, uh, and also uh, since you want to bring down the number to a manageable size, you will have a uh, either aptitude test or something like that, and then you go for the highest score, mm -hmm. most often, right? That's right. And the moment you go there, then you, yeah, obviously you get the the brainy guys. That's right. But you lose out some of the other things. So best is always not the most suitable. That's right. So even in an interview or in a selection tool, we come up saying, okay, he's the best out of the lot. But is he the most suitable? Then you need to look at, for example, uh, you, you select the best based on some of the, kids, some of the areas. For example, he performed well at the interview. He answered all the questions very well. He had the right competencies in place. Uh, well presented and well groomed, all, all those things are things that we look when you select the best. That's right. But for example, uh, he has the competencies, but do you check how he has used that competency in his previous job? So you need to dig deep to find that out. Right. So for example, many, 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 many times people say, yes, uh, yes, I have displayed. When you ask how, then then they get a little stuck, or, right. or if you, they, it takes about thirty seconds for them to come up with the example. So those we need to really dig deep to find the right fit. Uh, right fit is not only in terms of competencies, then the social aspect, the values of the organization, and your personal values. How does that fit uh, fit into the place? And all those things has to be considered to find the right fit for the role. Is not necessarily the best in the lot. Okay. okay. Um, I can remember there was a CEO once that once told me, uh, he said, I want for you to find the best candidate and then show me the second best candidate. Mm -hmm. And I asked the CEO, why? And the CEO says to me, because I want to hire the second best. And I said, nobody does that. Everybody looks for the best. Nobody wants to hire the second best. The CEO looks at me and says, yes, but in this pharmaceutical job that I'm looking for, if you hire the best, from the time you hire the guy, somebody wants to take them away. <laughs> and if you hire the second best, <clears throat> most often they will retain. So there are leaders of business that have their own philosophies. Uh, some philosophies are very different to the HR philosophies that one might have. Have you ever come across such um, visionary leaders of business who have had their own things? Any, any good stories f that you can share with us? Yes, I would say, for example, uh, something similar. A leader would always say, uh, Look at, okay, I said, I spoke about prerequisites, uh, job description and having a proper proper process, looking at those things and, but a leader might say, look, I don't need all of this. I know what I want. You, uh, I mean, personally, I have gone through some of the experience where my, my, some of my superiors have told me, look, you guys, HR guys will derive satisfaction out of these documents, but uh, I, I know what I want. I will find it. And I will prove to you that uh, he will succeed in the job. I, I won't go through all the jargon of uh, HR. <laughs> yeah, sometimes he will succeed, sometimes he may not. But That's there right. are leaders like that who at least who at least knows what he wants. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And they will cut across all processes, known processes, but they will find the right person. Um, and this becomes very important <laughs> in terms of recruitment and selection. Talk to me about competencies that you will test and how do you derive such competencies because now in this day of google.com mm. everybody is copy pasting competencies. Mm. Uh, for example, someone was talking to me about integrity and I asked what does that mean? He says well it's on the wall <laughs> because the values are normally on the wall. So, 
people play around with rhetoric, with, with words, in terms of all these competencies. Do companies really craft competencies which are important to them? I think some yes, some no. Uh, easiest thing is, uh, it depends, I would say it depends on what you try to achieve. If you want to tick a box saying, okay, I have done my competency profiling, then you might basically do uh, copy paste from the net. It's very easy. I mean, there are so many competencies, thousands of competencies, you can just copy paste and have the nice template. That's right. But really understanding the job, yes. which also changes, right? That's uh, right. Depending on the industry you are in, That's right. job changes. So competencies also change. So no point in having a nice document in your, in your drawer, which doesn't change. But after three years, that's totally mismatched from what you have and um, the real job, yes. which the line manager and the employee themselves know, and yes. the HR manager is kind of kept in the dark. <laughs> and um, competency, uh, many companies do have proper mechanisms to really understand what these competencies are. But at the same time, there's a, I think, good number of companies who do the other part, which is the copy pasting. Right. But those who actually understand it properly also, not everybody keeps up to date. Because it's very difficult. I mean, if you look at the day-to-day -day, day -day work, but that, that's the challenge. That's the challenge that that's the right. child has. Because uh, Dimitri was asking the company, uh, are these behavioral competencies important? And they say, yes, these behavioral competencies are very important. And I ask, what percentage of this have you uh, taken into account when it comes to appraisals? And many turn around and say, no, but appraisals that we, we look at KPIs, key performance indicators. And so this measurement of numerical versus behavior, is it important? I think both are important. Uh, it's about what you achieve and how you achieve it. Okay. See, for, I'll take an example, uh, take a sales person, right? so a salesman. You can have a KPI saying you need to achieve X million rupees yeah. as your sales budget. If you have that only, you, he will achieve. But if you are not paying attention to how he achieve, which is the behavioral part, uh, in the short term, you'll be okay. But after two years, you'll get to know what he did and how he did. And that can be basically detrimental to the company. So it's important that you monitor both. And at the same time, appraise both. Okay. And you need to, and uh, the superiors should be educated how to do that, because that's the diff most difficult. That's right. And that pr brings us to an important part, Dimut, where this <coughs> awareness process. We're still working around recruitment and selection. But we are looking into these auxiliary areas because all this needs to come in. Even at an interview uh, process, you have these line managers and all these types of people who will come together to choose the right con ca candidate, not necessarily only the HR. So training them on these competencies and getting them to realize the practical aspects of this can't be easy. How do you manage this? I can't say I have managed it. <laughs> I'm in the process of doing it. I'm okay. sure all HR people are in the same boat. Okay. Uh, I don't think anyone has uh, can put the hand up and say I have done it. Okay. Because it's it's a process. You you go through those motions every day. And uh, but I think we need to gradually up our game. Sure. Uh, first of all, line manager needs to understand. He, it's we are trying to recruit resource for that person and that resource that we give is going to help him to achieve his own goals. That's right. So that's why we should start. That's right. So if it is left to HR, there's going to be issues because if the guy doesn't perform, the line will say, you gave it to him. You gave me the person. So there has to be a concurrence binding, uh, a joint decision uh, between line and HR. Because even at during the selection process, these two people look at different things. The, the line manager should always look at the operational aspect of the job, and the child will look at uh, the fit, the culture, 
the social aspect of the person, whether he, uh, whether he will, what he will bring to the table. So yeah. these people look at different things, and then you need to discuss. That's right. And agree. Dimut, right. uh, we have many young viewers. I'm sure they are sitting there, <coughs> and they're very keen to understand. When they come for an interview, as much as many people talk about how to sit for an interview, how to prepare a CV and all of that, they want to know how HR professionals look at them. What do you actually see apart from the CV and their ability professionally? Mm -hmm. What else do you check? Right. See, first of all, I must say, uh, selection or an interview is, should be a two-way process. Many of us has got it wrong. Yeah. Mainly the culprits are in the company because we, when we go for an interview, we are always trying to differentiate. I am the interviewer. I am the boss in this room, and you are yeah, you are under me. Okay. The moment you do that, there is not going to be two-way process. Okay. You will, you will ask questions and he will just answer. So we, uh, I think we need to first break that, and. The youngsters and anybody, not, it doesn't have to be a youngster, anybody who will come for an interview should know it's a two-way process because it's an opportunity for the employer to assess the, empl uh, assess the candidate. At the same time, it's an opportunity for the candidate to assess the company. So many candidates don't think it like that. Uh, they themselves put themselves in this situation by just not asking right questions. Right. Uh, that is number one. Then also I see, uh, I would say there are must-haves. Let me just say a few. For example, uh, the person who comes for, to the job interview, first of all, should know what the job that he has applied for. <laughs> right? yeah. Many just walk into an interview and then sometimes even bold enough to ask the question, can you tell me what this job is all about? Because I'm sure half of the job description is anyway in the advertisement That's sometime, right. sometime. Yes. And if you read it properly, you should have some idea what the job is all about. And also the company that you have applied for, uh, they don't check. I mean, today if you want to know about a company, there are plenty of ways to find out. Yeah. But they just come and take the interview as an opportunity to ask about the company. So that, I would say that's a waste of time. So the uh, people on the other side, they judge you on those things. Yes. How prepared are you? And then uh, also if you shift industries, sometimes for example, uh, candidates say, uh, I'll, I'll take an example, uh, you might uh, say uh, from FMCG industry, you are coming now into, uh, let's say, hospital industry. It's very easy for you to say at the interview, uh, if someone asks an uh, operational question, you can always say, uh, I'm coming from FMCG industry, so I really don't know what hospital industry is. Is that the right answer? Because if you really want to impress the interviewer, there are so many hospital house, so hospitals out there. You just have to spend one hour before the interview. Go there, just watch. Uh, especially if you have applied for HR position, just hang out in the hospital for one hour. You will come across so many service failures process issues, training issues of the staff. If you come prepared with that information, even though you have worked in FMCG, you can impress the interview board. So you're basically, your learning cycle has shortened. That's right. right? So those things matter at an interview. So, but people don't, people don't think like that. People just come, they, they will talk about their experience uh, and qualification and think that will do. But that's, not, that's, that's the bare minimum, I would say. That's right. Uh, so those are some of the things that uh, I think youngsters should know. And then also come with examples of what you claim that you have. Yeah, I mean, the last thing you want is scratch your head and think for, a, uh, try to find an example uh, that will give a bad impression about you. So those are things that uh, people need to understand and understand the culture and values of the company yes. and see whether it is in sync with your own. That's right. If not, don't go for the interview. That's, I mean, you're not going to be, a, you're not going to be happy in that company. Uh, you, you may like the brand name of the company, but if you, if you find, really find out what that company is all about and what you want as a person, if it is not in line, I mean, I don't think it's going to work. Sure. 
It's interesting because here was an interview and a youngster walks in. The company is a very traditional company that has been there for decades. And the hairstyle of this individual, which almost looked like a rock star to mm -hmm. me at the time, the correct competencies were there, but the interview panel felt the person does not fit into the value stream of the business or does not actually look like what the company is looking for. Mm -hmm. With this younger generation coming into the workforce and the hairstyle is not necessarily the most important thing, for certain industries it is so, certain jobs it is so. Do you find it very hard with some of these judgments on hair and dress yeah, and all that? Not only judgment, the school. School. That's yes. the first thing. Uh, <laughs> the village or the town that you come from. Come from. The, the referees you have put. Yes. Many people think that if you put someone at a very high level in, your, in the society, that's going to add a lot of marks into that's your right. thing. Yes, it does matter uh, because it talks about credibility of the but not necessarily. So there are so many myths like that. At the same time, uh, judgment uh, made based on school and, and, and I have not come across uh, on religious biases so far. Or, or, but gender, yes, I've seen. Yes. If the job requires that, then that's different. But if not, I don't see any reason uh, we should discriminate people like that. That's right. How do companies and how do HR people manage this if the business or the line managers feel these biases are important to their operation? How do you stand your ground as a HR professional? So that has to come from top. We need to, uh, when we say culture is something that gets developed over time. Yeah. So things will change, uh, but it won't change if you just wait. Someone has to basically raise the flag, open discussions around it, and it will not happen overnight. Because these are, these are firm beliefs that is in mm. some of the pe some minds. So we need to change those things, we need to constantly raise the flag and, and basically shout in the boardroom and craft your culture in such a way uh, that those, those beliefs will not have a place in the recruitment and selection criteria. Right. People spend a lot of time in developing a CV at all levels of the business and they feel this one or two pieces of paper would save them. Hmm. From HR point of view, what do you really look for in a CV? If you had to just slash it and thrash it, what are the important parts you will go through? Yeah, uh, before I come to that, I'll, I have seen a CV, I think, I don't know whether, it's, whether I can call it a CV. Once I got a 32 slide presentation for a director position. Okay. I didn't call him for the in, for interview at all. Mainly, uh, that's my view. But see, uh, there are a lot of people uh, write a lot of things in a CV. It's a very difficult task, I would say, because you you want to say that's a document that you want to shout out and say this is what this is who I am. But at the same time, you got to make it short. I mean, try it. It's difficult, right? Uh, once I remember, we had a uh, we had a forty-page document, and we were asked to when one of the superiors said this is too long. Can you please condense it to 10 pages? So we did that. And then he said, no, most of the stuff I want is not here now. So I said, make up your mind. <laughs> so I mean, it's very difficult. You are talking about years of experience, qualifications, competencies, uh, things that you have done. And condense it to two bit is a tough task. But, but we must learn the art of doing it. And there are so many uh, formats available. At the same time, I need to tell. A lot of people use the same CV for various jobs. You need to understand, you need to, how, you need to know how to customize your CV to the job that you apply for. And certain jobs, some information is important, but others are not. So you need to place them on top or, or 
uh, shuffle the order right. and do something to basically catch the eye of the person who reads it. And some people try to be creative and put four-page document into two-page by reducing the font. And I think that's not the right thing to do because you don't know the person who reads it may be 60 years old, that's right. right? So, uh, and some goes into their personal vision out two uh, one and a half pages out of two is about his vision. vision. So those things doesn't take you much uh, anywhere. And uh, to answer your question, what I really look, uh, it, uh, I would say shortlisting happen in stages. First cut shortlist, we would, I would look at the bare minimum, whether it's there, what you really advertised for, right? And then you try to shortlist and screen out those who doesn't come into that lot. Okay. And then you have to spend time really reading, understand what he's trying to tell you. Uh, sometimes not everybody is articulate in a in, in way. So some people use different words, different language to say what they have to say. So you need to, uh, you need to give it a good hearing. But today's world, it's very difficult to spend a lot of time on shortlisting. Right. So candidate needs to understand. Uh, and, and say what you have to say in, in few lines yeah. in the most effective way. That's right. Uh, so what I would look for, I would say, I would see whether he, I would like to know why he has applied for this job. What is in it for him? Or has he just applied uh, because it's, it's a nice job? So, and I would like to know what his aspirations are. Because other, other, what is advertised in, uh, in the paper is a prerequisite, the, the educational qualification, the age, the uh, experience in the particular industry, those things must be there. Yeah. But other than that, I would look at those things to see why he has applied, what's the in intention, and what his career aspirations are. And can we fulfill that? If sure. not, no point in getting that guy because within a year or two he will leave. Okay. Because some people <coughs> write their employment record and then with the company and year they would talk about all the factors or the things that they've achieved in that job also. Now if you worked in about five companies and you have a list of things of duties that you've done, obviously you're going to overrun in terms of words and space. But many believe that that is important to be able to tell the world this is what I've achieved in these companies. Do you leave it for a secondary interview kind of process or do you want it in a CV format? From a professional point of view, many would have different ways of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. Just your experience, Dimut, how would you see it? See, I, people generally go step, one step at a time. So I always, as I told you earlier, I would first look at the bare minimum and then see whether I, there are details I want. If, I, if the detail is not there, I would look for it in a different way. Okay. But at the same time, if I, if I get, uh, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's, uh, there are different ways of doing it. Some annex it, not in the body. Okay. So uh, there's, a, there's an order and, and, and a pre-programmed way to present your idea. Okay. Some mix all things together and make an eight-page document. So, okay. I think it's the way you present also matters. Matters, okay. From an HR professional point of view, when your team talks to you and says, I want to develop on my recruitment skills, what are the essential <coughs> skills that you think that would be right for HR professionals to have or develop? I need to go back to the five concepts that I do. I think if you, if you Concentrate on those five, uh -huh. which I adapted from marketing. I think that's the start. Okay. Uh, if, you, if, I, if, I have to, if I have to summarize those things, understand your job, understand who the person is, what is the correct channel uh, to communicate, uh -huh. and uh, what are the tools to be used, okay. uh, and, and implement it properly, and, and be mindful of the the legislations and the compliance. If those five things are in place, I think that's a good start for any HR professional to have a good practice in your company. 
Very, very good. But I, would, I also must say it doesn't happen overnight. So you should not get discouraged that within two months things are not working properly because it will take time. And, but you should have a plan how to up your game over, over two or three years. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you were looking at a plan in terms of reading and understanding, how would you go about such things in this uh, whole arena of recruitment and selection? Yeah, there are so many literature available, yeah. people around to ask. I mean, Sri Lanka is a small country. The child fraternity is not that big. That's right. We all know each other. That's right. I think it's uh, reach out to help. I mean, the internet is there. You can you can read a lot of stuff. Okay. There are a lot of literature, books, research, and resource people. I think I don't think that's a that's a big task task at all. Um, I believe what we've discussed adds value to not only HR professionals, but it adds value to those that want to understand how they will be seen by HR professionals within this scope of recruitment and selection. Dimut, I think we've had a very, very good chat and very productive one at that. And um, thank you for the years of experience that comes up with certain aspects that you need to have in place. And you've been very crystal clear in some of these aspects. Uh, in this program, we hope that many would understand the techniques of this process. Go out there and have the will to want to learn. Go out there and check out. Once you do that, you will, it will open up into such an important factor. And I go back to your first point where you say you cannot take recruitment and selection in isolation. Mm -hmm. It is a set of building blocks that comes together to build this entire pyramid of managing people to the next level. Dimut, thank you so much for joining us at Transformers. We've actually loved having you and this discussion. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much.